On today's show, that is eight straight wins for the Cleveland Cavaliers. We'll get into that. Sam Merrill, a whole bunch more on a new episode of Locked On Cavs for January 23rd. You are Locked On Cavs, your daily Cleveland Cavaliers podcast. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on today to get started. I'm Chris Manning. That is Evan Damerel. Thanks again to Jake Stevens, as always, for his work on production. And we're here to talk about yet another Cleveland Cavaliers victory Cavs win in Orlando, 126-99. That is eight straight wins. Sam Merrill is Cleveland's high scorer with 26. We'll get to him in detail and and where he is right now in segment three. Donovan Mitchell has 25. Jared Allen has 14. Craig Porter Jr. has 12. Karis LeVert out with a wrist injury. Again, on top of Mobley and Garland being out, we'll get to the Karis LeVert news later in the show. But Evan, I start with this. Eight straight wins. Even if you can nitpick some of the opponents, hello, Washington Wizards, and all of that is nothing to see that this is the longest active winning streak in the NBA. That is absolutely something the Cavs should feel great about, um, even if you just look at the opponents and are underwhelmed. This is a real, real thing that I think tells us some really good things about where this team is at right now. Yeah, it really does. Um, I think it's just more so, again, it's another instance of, yeah, Donovan Mitchell and Darius, or sorry, not Darius Garland, Jared Allen were always as good as advertised. They've stepped up to the task. Mitchell tying a career high in assists that he set about a, less than a month ago at this point is really, you know, it's credit where credit's due, just how well he stepped up as a um, playmaker. And also just the fact that, like, Jared Allen continues to be super consistent. I'll talk about that more in the second segment, but, like, really stepping up in so many different ways. But, uh, we've talked about George Niang before on the show, Dean Wade having some crazy nights too, but like tonight's night was Sam Merrill's. I cannot say enough that he almost, he out, he hit more three pointers in the Orlando match did in the first half. Then almost outshot Orlando from three um, before the game kind of just went to absolute garbo time towards the end where Orlando eventually outshot Sam 11 to eight from the perimeter. Like, Sam Merrill just really stepped up in this one. Again, like you said, we'll talk about him more in the third segment, but th- these are just impressive wins the Cavs are continuing to string together. And I think for me, what stands out the most is they come out dominant to start a game and they just never really relent until either JB calls off the dogs and it turns into garbage time or the final buzzer sounds and it's just like a catastrophic margin of victory like the, the game against the Wizards. Yeah, I, I mean, even if you look at Orlando as a team and you look at how they get this day straight win, Orlando comes in, they are they got healthy the previous game. They beat Miami the night before. You get Franz Wagner back. They readjust the starting lineup. And you, I think they certainly looked a little bit like a team on the second night of a back-to-back energy-wise. But this is a team that even with some recent struggles, even with the, the recent injury issues on the year, has been a solid, competent NBA team. And this game was never competitive in any stretch of the imagination, Cleveland won the first quarter 38 to 19. Repeat that. They doubled up Orlando in the first quarter, a 38 to 19 advantage. As a team, you look at you look at any of the numbers, the Cavs only trailed they they, tr- they led for 11 minutes and 40 seconds. Orlando never led, so they just never led this entire game. The Cavs shot 63% from the field and 57% on twos. They shot 66.7% on threes. Everything was just dominant. Everything was clean. Everything was just much, much better than Orlando was. And 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 I mean, I think if you look at this game and the Atlanta game specifically, the thing that would make me the most optimistic about this, if I'm the Cavs and the way they're winning right now, even if 
integrating back in Mobley and Garland will be, I think, a ch- something of a challenge just based on their high wattage players and all of that and style of play differences with them. Certainly more so Mobley. The fact that they are winning these games and it's not necessarily, Hey, Donovan Mitchell's taking over the entire game. Like he had six points in the first quarter and they won it by 19 points. It is minutes from everyone points from everywhere. That is really what is elevating this team. It's not just one thing. It certainly maybe extends for Mitchell, but it's, everyone and that to me is is maybe the most impressive part of this win in, in this whole run i know people will weirdly speculate that the Cavs should consider trading darius garland and evan mobley after these kind of wins or is the fact that they've won eight in a row which as chris noted at the top of this segment is currently the longest active winning streak in the eastern conference we'll see how it goes obviously in these two games and three nights against milwaukee to end the week on wednesday and friday but in the moment, like the, the Cavs could be coming home against the Clippers, uh, either winners of 10 in a row, or maybe they reset the winning streak and they're trying to go for two in a row against the Clippers or something. But either way, um, the Cavs have been super impressive, and I think they are really hitting their stride at the right time. I think they're starting to gel and find this cohesiveness where they want to be the team they said they wanted to be offensively to start the season, where their defense kind of dictates the offensive flow, and their defense just creates easier bucket opportunities for them, especially just on the fast break. And there's going to be growing pains, but seeing games like this, which is just it's random guys stepping up and stepping out, does give me a reason for optimism to say that Darius Garland and Evan Mobley will have an easier time acclimating because I think that they're just either going to be the beneficiaries of having like one stellar game after post injury and post recovery, or more so the fact that just like the Cavs are just clicking on so many different levels that it would be hard not to integrate a guy, even if there are a few, like maybe small missteps and bumps in the road to start it out. But like this team is hitting their stride. I think they are in this weird spot where they can, not easily integrate two key figures back into the rotation and lineups, but like have an easier time at doing so just because of how good the entire picture looks when adding maybe two more strokes of color to this painting. I think too, with this game in particular, just you you look at the way this is just kind of breaking down. Maybe this is one of those games where you ran a little hot, but I think I, I'm of the belief that sometimes when you play the way you are and you're playing with a certain energy, that can you can unlock some of that. The, for this whole game, the numbers Cleveland posted to win this one are kind of absurd. 56% from the field. Nearly 53% from three. Only turned the ball over nine times versus 15 for Orlando. There's only one player, Evan, without looking. Can you tell me the one player who had a negative plus minus? Hmm, Damian Jones. That is right. Damian Jones, who did hit a corner three in this game. Like, so this like, game had everything. probably the guy who played the least amount of minutes. So I'm trying to think, like, <laughs> eight minutes the, and 30 seconds. The Cavs gave seconds, up quite yep. a bit of points, like, at the end of the game. I mean, I know they were outscored in the third as well, but... Um, yeah, I'm, I'm also not surprised because Jones was one of the last-minute substitutions for uh, the Cavs. Yeah, but you come out hot in the first, you double it up, you win the second by six, you win the third by eight, and the game is functionally over. They are playing with such energy right now that you can have like kind of ho-hum two quarters where you measly win by six or win by eight, and it's, it's kind of already over. Really good Cavs win, really good win streak. Puts them, we should just note, because we're going to note this all the time, in a really good spot as far as standings goes. They're now a full game up on the Knicks uh, as the four-seed Philly buoyed by Joel Embiid's monster night uh, is two and a half ahead of the Cavs, but the Cavs are now a full game up on the Knicks, two full games up, excuse me, three full games up on the Miami Heat and the Indiana Pacers and are now a full four and a half games up on the eight-seeded Orlando Magic. So if you're looking at what this win streak has done, to get this team in really good position for a top four seed and maybe push for a top three seed at some point. And the, those games against Milwaukee who are even record wise with Philly. So two and a half ahead of the Cavs certainly will matter to this. You're in a pretty darn good spot. If you're pushing for the high seed, you can, if you're the Cavs right now, I know it's not even February yet. The deadline's not here yet. The all-star games in here yet, but 
the playoffs are going to come sooner than you think, and all these games are going to matter. All right, after this, game awards. That's MVP, that's stat of the night, that's play of the night. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. The NFL regular season is over. The playoffs are ongoing. You're getting tons of fun NFL playoff games right now. Uh, Bruton, for the record, for not the Ravens. But the but America's number one sports book still gives you time to wrap up and get in a volley action. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. That is $150 in bonus bets win or lose the app is so easy to use and there are so many different ways to bet like live saving game parlays you can find bets in their new explore tab you can make parlays in the parlay hub which is the best way to find popular parlays and much much more the Cavs, if you're looking at this game came in as one point favorites they blew that out of the water they'll have lines up fan duel for Cavs, bucks the next couple of days they have nba awards and all of that stuff as well. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and make your first bet a layup. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. Evan, who's your MVP? Um, I think it's fair to make a toss up between Donovan Mitchell and Sam Merrill, but I'm going to go with Donovan Mitchell in this one just because he was red hot in the first half i think he had like nine or maybe ten assists by the time halftime sat or came around for cleveland and just again has really really stepped up is starting to show again that he has that super red hot motor that the Cavs can lean on but i think they're not having to lean on him fully like they've had the benefit of resting him the better part of this fourth quarter against Orlando. I think the better part of the fourth quarter against Atlanta as well. Like they, the team is stepping up and kind of meeting Mitchell at the summit in different ways, but Mitchell has continuously just been this driving force on offense for them. And it's been really impressive for me. Um, And that's just my MVP pick. Who's yours? It, it's Sam Merrill. We'll talk about, I want to talk about Mitchell for one more second because the number one thing for me coming into this game that I was excited about was watching Jalen Suggs, who rules. I love Jalen Suggs, um, defend Donovan Mitchell. And Donovan Mitchell had no problems getting by or attacking or getting Jalen Suggs moving all over the place and manipulating him. Unbelievable stuff from Donovan Mitchell. And it wasn't even like, like this is like a B Donovan Mitchell performance. to some, like Maybe not a B. Maybe it's like an A- minus because he has 25 and 13 versus three turnovers, but he wasn't like he was nine and 19 from the field. He sets the bar so high that this kind of game, I'm just like, he was pretty good. He was fine. And he like torched one of the best perimeter defenders, one of the best guard defenders, at least in the league. He's not even Mitchell, pretty darn good at basketball. Uh, yeah. Sam Merrill. It's it's yeah, go ahead. Also, I mean, yeah. Um, he, he's just really good. Um, that, that's all you really can say about it. So, He's awesome. And yeah, but Sam Merrill, let's talk about him. So we'll get to where he is going in segment three, but this game, eight of 13 from three, all of his shots were threes, 26 points, two free throws. Dude's just a absolute sniper. Dude is the best off ball shooter on this team. I'll, Mac, he just is more accurate and almost more varied to some degree than what Max Struess is. Max Struess is a more complete player by leaps and bounds and more playoff proven and all that. But Merrill is just an absolute weapon as a shooter. Um, we're seeing it time and time again. And to just be this kind of guy who just takes threes confidently and lights it up like this is very fun. And he was, he was kind of the, like how George and Yang had that insanely, on point night the other night this was kind of Merrill's moment to just be like the random Cavs bench guy during this run to ascend and do all kinds of awesome stuff all right let's go to play of the night Evan you have a great one so let's start let's start with your play of the night sure um so about four ish minutes left in the second quarter uh Franz Wagner challenges uh Jared Allen to defend him in isolation uh one-on-one scenario you know typically speaking that's the right call if you're an opposing team because this is Cleveland's, at least orientation-wise, better rim protector and pain protector, and also just a traditional big man. Like You don't expect him to be comfortable defending in space, but he really was comfortable defending Wagner in isolation, and I was really impressed by this, and also just the fact that like he knew he defended that play so well that when Wagner put up the shot, 
Allen was already trailing to the other end of the court. Uh, it was a miss. The Cavs rebounded, kicked it out to Allen, who was on the other end of the floor. Cherry picked off Orlando for an easy two points. And it's, again, just not the fact that, like, he has the flashiest numbers. Like, he's averaging quite a bit more in about roughly the same minutes per game uh, seasonally for Cleveland this year. But just moments like that you're like oh wow he is really stepping up to the task and really has just like shown out for the Cavs in this and just this game is just another instance of it yeah this play was just peak Jared Allen versatility on display you love to see him defending in, in that way and in space and just kind of managing things perfectly in that exact kind of structure so great job for Jared on that play my play we're gonna go a Donovan Mitchell pass because you had this play in the second quarter where he he gets trapped by two guys. Jalen Suggs ends up becoming the third guy helping off of him. And Donovan Mitchell just puts the ball perfectly into Max Struess's gullet as Max Struess, as Jared Allen setting a screen uh, on the big who could come out and help him. And Max Struess six a corner three. Mitchell's been really good as a passer in the way the Cavs are playing of late. And this particular pass, when he has Franz Wagner on him, Anthony Black helps off really aggressively. And Jalen Suggs comes to help on him, and he makes this perfect on-point pass. Just really, really good stuff from Donovan Mitchell. Been very, very impressed with the way he's played as a passer, I think, especially of late. And he, the pass is just also another example of how absurd his core strength is because he and, – and his long arms too, I guess. But he gets the ball with one hand, and he whips it across his body. Like, it's not – And this isn't an easy pass. He's not really looking, and he wings it in between two long defenders – it's just an absurd pass if you just think about like the biomechanics of how a human body should work. Yeah, and it's weird just because, again, like Mitchell is a smaller guard. There comes a point when that athleticism wears out, or like maybe just like that burst. But <clears throat> I think his core strength is just so good, and like you said, his biomechanics and just body mechanics and body control in general is just so refined and I think like a really underappreciated and underrated asset maybe of his game at least it from my viewing just from him joining the Cavaliers versus his time with Utah where I wasn't watching all 82 games a season plus postseason with him and with the Jazz but he has just been continually really impressive like there was that moment when he had um it was like a floater layup or like it was just like insane body control for him to like kind of like just get that shot because it was so close to the rim and it just looks so clean and effortless like when you start to break down the semantics of what Donovan Mitchell does physically, it really starts to boggle the mind on how he's able to physically do it. But it's also just really impressive because he makes it look so effortless as well. Like that's, that's what always stands out to me when it comes to that. All right, let's go to stat of the night. Mine is, is about the defense. This has kind of been an offensive run, I think in a lot of ways for Cleveland. But for me, this, this, this story of this game and, and this resource is partially about how good the defense has been and this was another Cavs game where they put up a really good defensive performance. Orlando at last check finished with an offensive rating of 106.8. This is now the fifth straight game. The Cavs have held the team below 107, which is very, very good. And they're seventh, seven out of eight games during this win streak. They have held teams below that mark, which is significantly better than league average. It is an elite, elite number. So the Cavs defense right now, despite no Evan Mobley is playing at a really high level. And that's, Again, it's not great competition, but there's something interesting about that. Evan, what's your stat? Uh, my stat of the night is the fact that, well, again, Sam Merrill tied the record he had already tied with most um, three-pointers made for reserve as a Cavs player, but more so the fact that Jared Allen now owns the franchise record with 12 straight double-doubles. I know it seems simple enough. He has to get 10 points and 10 rebounds, but I think, again, that's just like another, like, tent pole or crystallization of just like how much he has stood up and stood out for the Cavs with no Garland, with no Mobley. And he has just become like in that game against Wagner, um, like that two way wrecking force that you need him to be. Coming up after this, let's dive into Sam Merrill and we'll talk about Karis Levert's wrist injury. Perhaps the only sour news for the Cavs at this moment in time. 
Today's episode is brought to you by Prize Picks. Prize Picks is the largest DFS platform in North America. That's Daily Fantasy Sports. They are the easiest and most exciting way to play DFS. It is just you against the numbers. Instead of battling thousands of other players, including pros and sharks, you just pick more or less than on two to six player stat projections and watch the winnings roll in. Basketball season is here, and you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from their specials league. That is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. So you could pick Travis Kelsey and LeBron James at a combo of 10.5 three-pointers made in receptions. And you can also play alongside some of Prize Picks' favorite players, like the rapper Meek Mill and the comedian Andrew Schultz. So go to prizepicks.com. Backslash locked in NBA and use our code locked on NBA for a first deposit match up to a hundred dollars. Again, that is prizepicks.com backslash locked in NBA and use code locked in NBA for a first deposit match up to one hundred dollars. Prize picks daily fantasy sports made easy. All right, let's start with Sam Merrill and we'll end on the Karis River bit of this. Evan, you have a, a point in our in our outline doctor that I like in that you are maybe thinking of him as more than just a dude who could fill minutes for you and is an end of the rotation flyer, someone that, you know, didn't have a guaranteed contract. You could have seen them just being like, peace out. Let's save some money. We, you don't matter to us. Do you now look at him and think, okay, Darius Garland's back in a couple of weeks, or maybe after this road trip, Evan Mobley's back in a couple of weeks. Karis Silver will be back from this wrist injury. That doesn't seem to be super serious. Mm-hmm. Should this guy just play? Like, should this guy just be getting minutes once this team is actually healthy? I think that's the question because we had bounced around this idea when this team is fully healthy. We, we talked about the guys that are staples in this rotation. Garland, Mitchell, Struce, Mobley, Allen, Levert, Okoro, uh, Niang as well. And then we talked about how JB is typically a guy that goes eight to nine players deep nine being like the absolute absolute like limit most nights and Merrill was in that conversation with like Craig Porter Jr. Dean Wade who has also played very well at times especially in Chicago recently but I just think for me of like Merrill like we're consistently seeing these really efficient three-point shooting performances. I think it's really beneficial that he is, I don't want to say an understudy, but he has the same agent as Max Struess. Like he and Struess, um, he, he studies Max Struess quite a bit. They work together to talk with each other because of the mutual agency and now that they're teammates. Like I think the fact that the Cavs have the added luxury of running sets and plays that they may run for Max Struess or just actions or wrinkles that they may run for Max Struess or some of their other shooters for Merrill is just a spoil of wealth. And I think just the fact that he has stepped up and really just been so consistent for Cleveland, like I think we need to have that conversation where Merrill should – be a part of this rotation on a night to night basis, whether that means he eats at uh, Tristan Thompson's minutes. If Thompson is like the guy who's ahead of him in the pecking order, if he eats at George Niang's minutes, if he kind of just eats minutes from the greater picture as just like, you know, the, the Cavs go deeper into the rotation. Like I just think he's played so well, like you can't not re- award him and just stash him on the bench, just letting him completely cool off after he's been so red hot lately. I think if you want to keep playing a style of play too, and this is now part of your identity, this has to just be someone you have to give a look at. We did this exercise once before with him, or I think with Craig Porter Jr., but let's do this again. We're going to go through the roster, and we're going to say, okay, is this guy in the rotation when this team is fully healthy? And and there's probably a whole episode to do to build out. Ahead of the deadline, I think perhaps, too, to just build out, okay, what is this roster? Where could they improve on? All that stuff. Starters, I think we we understand all these guys are going to be in there. Fully healthy, it's going to be Garland, Mitchell, um, Struess, Mobley, Allen. So there's five. Okay. Yeah. Then Karis LeVert, that's six. Isaac Okoro, seven. Dean Wade is eight. Niang is nine. I think Merrill is the tenth guy. I think so, too. Um, With it being a bit more fluid towards the back end of the rotation, just because, like, if you have a hot hand, that that trumps the other guy, whether that's George Niang, 
or maybe even Isaac Okoro as well. If like Sam Merrill sometime somehow leapfrogs those guys, like that's fine um, because Merrill is giving you the hot hand and the, the hot shooting. And like you said, like stylistically, he matches a lot of what they want to play right now. Um, and I think that's just kind of what matters most. Um, it's just really it just makes sense at least just to kind of keep him on the up and up in terms of just rotation stuff and just how he fits for this team currently offensively. I, I would add to I would add this too. Evan Mobley will give you another big. So let's just say there's nights where you want the extra shooting or Niang isn't playing well, or Dean Wade isn't, who's playing well of late, isn't shooting it well. You get to a spot where you just say, okay, we don't need to, we can skew a little smaller and get away with it. And Sam Merrill is a smart defender, is all of these things that I think are proving him capable. Like he's, I don't trust him he's defending real, like the he's best. He's a real gym rat. Uh, first one in, last one out. Brings a lunch pail to every single weight <laughs> station as he lifts. Well, but he's at least like aware, like he is at least like aware and is going to fight and is smart. And like, there's value in him, like against the Hawks, he was the guy that the Hawks tried to hide Trey Young on. And then he's making Trey Young like have to actually work on defense, right? Like there's value in that. So I think there's going to be nights where like, okay, a core is not playing well. Merrill gets more minutes. If Dean Wade's not shooting, we skew smaller. We play Sam Merrill. You know, like that that's gonna ha- that that I think is gonna be part of his value. And I think this is just now a lever that if I'm Bickerstaff, I probably I think I certainly just feel more comfortable pulling now than I would have before this run. Yeah. Um the Trey Young thing is interesting at least just because like you said, he at least made Young not like totally hideable against Cleveland. Like you have to respect what Merrill gives you on offense, and I think also, like, if the Hawks are trying to, you know, not let him be, like, a mismatch or just, like, find him easier looks to maybe bully upon, like, sure, he is the weaker link in some lineups defensively compared to maybe what Cleveland has available when they are at full strength. Like, but he has, like, that, I don't want to say he's on the same level as Max Trues, but he plays with enough hustle and enough energy that he does give you that extra effort where you are probably tapping out everything possible out of him when you're he's playing for you minutes-wise, but he's going to give you high quality minutes when he does play for you. And you should just reward that and let him play on a consistent basis when this team's healthy. Last bit of news. We have Karis Levert missed his second straight game with a wrist injury reporting from Chris Fedor and, and others ha- does not seem to indicate that this is a real concern that it's been bothering him for about a week. But I mean, it, it's obviously Evan. I think just considering the the vast amount of injuries this Cavs team has had, it's just it's it's a bummer. That it's like, I guess another guy that plays real minutes for us and is one of our highest salary players is on the sideline with an injury. Like, surely that is just something that we have to to deal with again. That that's kind of the bummer to me about this. It is a bummer. I think you noticed it. Um... Wednesday when Cleveland was last home against Milwaukee that the the wrist was certainly bothering him when he was playing for the Cavs. I think he was one of seven shooting wise from the floor and Milwaukee wasn't playing good defense in that game. So you can't say the Bucks out through the clamps on him. Like the Milwaukee's not a good defensive team this season. And I think George and Yang just having like such an insane night really uh, maybe put a little bit of like a dampening on the noise around Levert's wrist, but Atlanta was coming off the second game of a back-to-back against Cleveland, ditto for Atlanta, Orlando. I think the Cavs are kind of juiced at a certain point right now. They can afford to rest Levert. Yeah, it does stink when you already are so undermanned. Uh, you don't have Darius Garland on this road trip. Evan Mobley is traveling but won't play at this point. Um, like yeah, You want to have as many bodies available, especially when you go to Milwaukee and play them for two games in three nights. But thankfully if there's a silver lining to this cleveland does have tuesday off they have wednesday to see if lavert is available to go it is encouraging at least that he went from doubtful to questionable slash a game time decision against orlando so maybe he is trending upward um like you said uh it's been widely reported like this isn't expected to bother him for very very long so maybe the Cavs are just using the luxury of facing teams on the second game of back-to-back and also being red hot just to allow this guy to rest and kind of get right because it clearly was affecting him the other night when he last played for cleveland 
We're going to end there. I'm Chris Manning. That is Evan Damerel. Thanks again to Jake Stevens, as always, for his work on production. Back on at Car- you a- on what? So say, we're on a Carl Anthony Towns pack watch tonight, folks. He has 62 points, and they may lose to the Hornets. Yeah, I have that game on as we're going here, and so uh, that I, loss I'm is stunned. not – it's not, I'll say this, that loss is uh, not going to, certainly jokes, but I don't think that loss is um, exactly on him. But check out Locked on Wolves, check out Locked on Hornets if you want analysis of that game. Check out Locked on NBA as well, I'm sure they'll cover it there. Thanks again to Jake Stevens, back at you tomorrow, getting you ready for Cavs Bucks, getting you talking about how those teams match up. We'll talk to you then, enjoy the rest of your Tuesday.